is all about the coronation, isn't it? Um, I bet you're all really looking forward to your spinach and broad bean quiche um, <laughs> for lunch. Emma is shaking her head with a look of disgust. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know quite what they were thinking. Um, coming up with a new national dish. Did you know, by the way, that coronation chicken, if you've ever seen coronation chicken sandwiches, I know for many of us, um, sandwiches aren't our favorite thing. Um, you know, the British seem, you know, fairly passionate about sandwiches for lunch. I know it's not everyone's thing. But Coronation Chicken, that, that dubious sandwich filling, um, was invented to celebrate the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. And so Charles had Coronation Quiche. Um, and that's a broccoli and broad bean quiche. There you go. I don't know why I'm telling you all of this. It has nothing whatsoever um, to do with what I'm preaching today. Um, but yesterday was all about this um, moment. Um, in theory, in theory, as king of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and a number of other places, um, Charles is supposed to reign over the British people. But in reality, of course, we know that that is kind of mostly, with no disrespect, to King Charles, but that is kind of mostly ceremonial and symbolic. What difference does his kingdom actually make in our lives? Because right now, there are people sitting homeless on the streets of this city. Right now, there are people dying in our hospitals and in their homes of incurable diseases. There are people in this moment struggling to work out how they are gonna put food on their table this week. There are people who have been abused, who've suffered trauma, who are living in torment. There are people who are grieving today. There are people who are mentally ill. There are people who have lost all hope in the face of injustice. There are people afflicted by dark spiritual forces at work in their lives. There are people trapped in addiction and destructive habits. There are people who just cannot seem to break free from their sense of guilt or shame. There are broken people everywhere living in a broken world. And of course, after all the bunting and all the flags are taken down at the end of this weekend, nobody really expects the reign of King Charles to make that much difference to all of that. Nobody's really, as much as we celebrate and we honor and we give respect to the king and the traditions of the nation, and, but nobody really expects, do they, that this kingdom, this reign of King Charles, that word kingdom, it, it describes not just a, a realm, not just a physical place, but the actual ruling and reigning of the king. Nobody really expects him being on the throne, his ruling and reigning, really to change all of those things that I've just described. Let's look together at the Bible, and we're going to start at the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, from verse 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. Right at the beginning, God spoke light into the darkness of our world, into the emptiness, into the chaos and the confusion. God spoke and there was light. And God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. 
And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And so creation continued. God continued to speak. And out of the emptiness, out of what was formless and void, out of the darkness and the confusion, not only did light come, but life began to emerge in our world. And there were fishes in the sea, and there were birds in the sky, and there were animals on the land. And then, on the sixth day, God said, Verse 26, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every living creature that moves on the ground. God made a perfect world to live in perfect, harmonious relationship with himself. And that would be the key to everything. If everything would only exist in its proper, harmonious relationship to God himself, the king of the universe, then we would live in a perfect kingdom. A kingdom marked by God's presence, by God's goodness, by God's love, by God's perfection. Everything perfectly ordered, everything as it should be. And that was his intention. Having created us as the pinnacle of his creation, he said, you live in relationship, in my image, in relationship to me, you live and you bring, you bring all of this goodness to the ends of the earth. Genesis chapter 2, and verse 8 and 9, says this, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Two trees in the middle of this garden, whether it is literal or whether it is symbolic, it doesn't really matter in this moment the fact is, God puts before us, he creates us, and he, and he puts these two trees before us. And there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's a, there's a tree that represents who gets to decide what is right and what is wrong. And there is a tree of life. Now, God has just created all life. He is the source of all life. He is the father of life. And he wants to give us access to his life. And so we read in Genesis 2, 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it you will certainly die. God says, I'm not withholding anything from you, not even the tree of life. I am the source of life, and you can enjoy my life for eternity. The only thing you have to do to enjoy this life forevermore, the only thing you have to do to always live in my life, in my wholeness, in my goodness, in the fullness of my kingdom, the only thing you have to do is let me continue to be the one who decides what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. I have to be your definition of good and bad, right and wrong. I have to be your God. I have to be your king. I have to be the ruler of your life and of everything. God is the source of life. And when we reject 
his authority, when we reject his rule, when we reject his reign, we cut ourselves off from the source of life. When we cut ourselves off from him, we're not, we're, he, he's not saying, right, well, I'll smite you then. In that moment, we are cutting ourselves off from the very source of life. And so we read in Genesis 3, verses 1 and onwards. Now the snake, who in this story represents the enemy, the devil, the accuser, he has different names in scripture. Now the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Notice that, by the way. God didn't say that at all. God did not say you must not eat from any tree in the garden, but already the enemy is sowing lies and doubts, twisting what God has said. The woman said to the snake, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will, cert you will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman. But God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You see, that's the temptation here, to make ourselves God. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for no gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And how many of us know that? That our, when we give in to temptation, when we give in to sin, it nearly always ends up with us hiding from God. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, it was the woman's fault. <laughs> well, that's been happening ever since, hasn't it? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the snake deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the snake, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel and to the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you listened to your, life, your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground since, you were, since from it you were taken. For dust you are and to dust you will return. We rejected God's authority. And in that moment, we gave authority to the enemy. We as humanity... We rejected God's authority. See, God's beautiful, amazing plan was that we would live in this perfect relationship with him. And out of perfect relationship with him, we would extend that perfect relationship, that perfect harmony to everything. So everything throughout the earth would exist in perfect, harmonious relationship with God. And that way, 
there would be no crime, there would be no injustice, there would be no poverty or oppression, there would not be natural disasters, there would not be anything breaking down and going wrong with our world, because everything, even creation itself, even in a way that our minds can't fully comprehend, even like the natural environment would be existing in perfect relationship with God. But we said, no, we're going to give authority away. God said, you can have this perfect world, you can have this perfect existence, if only you will allow me to be your God and king. And we said, no, we want to be king ourselves. And so we took that authority that belonged to God, and we gave it away to the enemy. We said, we'll follow what you say. In that moment, the Bible teaches us, we became his that he began to rule and reign in our world. See, we experience our plunging of this world into the dominion of darkness in three main ways. Because that's what we did. God created us to be part of stewarding his beautiful kingdom, and instead we plunged our world into the dominion of darkness. And we experience that in three major ways. Spiritual forces of evil are at work in our world. Depending on your background, you are more or less aware of this. Here in, you know, modern Western Britain, we're not always so aware of spiritual forces at work, but they are at work all the time in an unseen realm. And we gave authority away. Humanity, we gave authority away. And so there are spiritual forces at work in our world, sometimes through power structures, through systems of government, sometimes through dark spiritual forcing, attacking the individual lives of Christians. But we experience satanic forces at work in our world, manipulating, attacking, tormenting, afflicting, binding up and keeping captive. Secondly, creation is broken. Creation itself is broken and in decay. And so we see our world falling apart around us. We see climate change, global warming. We see droughts. We see crops failing. We see earthquakes. The world is groaning. The world is falling apart. All because, all rooted in our joint collective rejection of God's authority over this world. And because creation is broken, we experience sickness. You see, sometimes sickness might be an attack of some demonic force, an attack of the enemy in our lives, but often it's just because we live in a broken world. It's still ultimately rooted in our sin and rebellion, but not necessarily as some kind of punishment or direct consequence, just because we live in a fallen world. There would not be these kind of bacterial and viral infections if we haven't fallen as humanity. But because we did, because we rejected God's perfect order, we live in a broken world. Creation is broken, and ultimately, we will all die. It's a cheery one today, isn't it? (laughs) We will all die unless Jesus comes first. And thirdly, firstly, it was spiritual forces of evil at work in our world. Secondly, creation is broken. Thirdly, sin is crouching at our door and it desires to have us. That's a phrase that the Bible uses when God is speaking to Cain uh, in Genesis chapter 4. And he warns him, he says, sin is crouching at your door because now your status has changed. Humanity has fallen and broken and given that authority away and sin is always there waiting to pounce. Temptation is always present. There is something about our human condition in and of itself that is broken and we became captives. Outside of Christ, we became captives to sin. And that sin can cause suffering in our own lives. And that sin can cause suffering in the lives of people around us. And those who die in sin will spend eternity separated from God, shut out from his life-giving presence. And the Bible calls that hell. The situation 
is dire. The situation is bleak. Our world is broken because we gave authority away. We said, as humanity collectively, we said, let's go for the dominion of darkness. And that's what we did. The enemy caused all of this by tempting us to reject our relationship with God. By tempting us to reject him as king. We were supposed to live in this beautiful kingdom of God filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. But instead, we found ourselves in the dominion of darkness. Now, the rest of the Old Testament tells a story of hope, praise God, in the midst of sin and despair. God forms a people for himself, and he promises that through this people, he will ultimately send a savior. Not only to rescue that people, but actually to bless all the nations of the earth. To bring people back into right relationship with himself. He promises a deliverer, a savior, a messianic king who will come and finally make it possible once more for God's people, for all people who choose to come to him to live as part of the kingdom that he always intended. That he would not abandon us to this world that we created, filled with the dominion of darkness. That he would not abandon us to that, but that he would make a way for his kingdom to be established in the earth. And of course, this messianic king was Jesus. Only he didn't arrive like a king. He didn't look like a king. He didn't behave in the kind of ways that people were expecting from a king. But right after Jesus went through his own temptation, right after Jesus faced the enemy like we faced the enemy at the beginning, we said, well, that sounds good. But right after Jesus himself faced temptation from the enemy and resisted and did not sin and did not reject God's lordship over his life, We read this in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. I'm not shouting at you, by the way. I'm just excited. (laughs) Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. These people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Kingdom of heaven, by the way, uh, many of you have heard us say this many times. Kingdom of heaven, it means the same thing in your Bible as kingdom of God. It's the same phrase. Matthew uses kingdom of heaven. All the other writers use kingdom of God. He's saying heaven or God's rule and reign has come near to you. In fact, Jesus says it is now time to think differently and turn your whole life around. Repent, he says. Reorder your life. Reorientate your life. Stop thinking the way you used to think and think differently from here on in because God's kingdom, God's rule and reign The way that things were always supposed to be. That has finally come near to you. He told all who would listen to repent and turn their lives around. And they needed to repent because God's kingdom had come near to them. What was lost and impossible to attain. Because we were living in the dominion of darkness. What was lost to us has now come near to us again because Jesus has made it possible. And so he went about healing the sick and casting out demons. And these were signs of the kingdom. In Acts 10.38 it says 
that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And in Matthew 12, 28, Jesus says, if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus was proving that he has the power to set us free from the darkness, to deliver us, to rescue us. We gave all the authority away. We gave it all to the enemy. We subjected ourselves to the dominion of darkness. We brought it all on ourselves. We brought it all on ourselves and on everything around us in this world. But Jesus is the one who has the power to deliver us from the dominion of darkness. If only we will receive him again as our king. John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus says, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, then you have to be born again. If you want to enter into that kingdom, if you want to be part of God's eternal kingdom, a little bit later on in verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, would not suffer that eternity shut out from God's life-giving presence, would not perish, but would have eternal life would live forever in perfect relationship with God and be part of this beautiful kingdom that God has always intended for our world. Jesus makes it possible for us to permanently enter into God's kingdom by restoring us into right relationship with God. And one day, all of creation will be restored. Jesus will return and there will be new heavens and a new earth. The Bible says the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God. But until that day comes, we live in a kind of overlap of the ages where God's kingdom has come near and we can enter into it, but we don't yet experience the fullness of it. We still experience the opposition of spiritual forces. We still experience the brokenness of our world that we live in. We still experience the effects of sin. But we have hope. We have this gospel, this good news of God's coming kingdom, of God's kingdom that has come near to us and that we have by faith entered into. We've tasted the powers of the age to come and we will reign with Jesus Christ for all eternity. Colossians chapter one. I'm nearly there, folks. Colossians chapter one from verse nine. I believe some of this may have been read yesterday at a certain service. I wanted to put it in its full context. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Remember, it's not fully yet. So you're going to need great endurance and patience to carry on holding out hope in the midst of suffering and darkness. But that's what you're called to do. As a child of God, you are called to endure with great patience as you continually unceasingly, without swerving, without backing off, you continue to proclaim, there is a king, and he has a kingdom, and that kingdom is coming, and it's going to fill the whole earth, and you can be a part of it. You can be set free from the dominion of darkness and all of its effects in your life. Giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. 
for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is therefore, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. All the powers of darkness are broken and defeated. All the powers of darkness broken and and defeated. He is our deliverer. He rescues us from the dominion of darkness. As humanity, we were trapped in the consequences of our own decision, but Jesus has made a way for us to be rescued and be part of the kingdom that God has always intended. In Colossians 2, 13 to 15, it says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over them by the cross. You know, every time we break bread, the Bible says we proclaim Jesus' death until he comes. That's our gospel. Jesus has died and at the cross it was finished. He's done everything that is necessary. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. And now we can enter into and stand in that freedom. 1 John 3 verse 8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. To reverse what happened right at the beginning. This, my friends, is the gospel that Jesus lived, proclaimed, and demonstrated. And this is the gospel, the amazing good news that he has entrusted to you and to me. So easy to get buried in Netflix and Disney Plus and whatever else, TikTok, so easy to start believing the narrative of a world that loses sight completely and turns passages of scripture into ceremonial moments that will then be forgotten and we will all move on from. But this is our truth. This is our constant truth that we must live with at the forefront of our hearts and minds until the day we die and go to be with him. We are waiting for a kingdom. We have entered into a kingdom. We are starting to experience a kingdom. We are demonstrating that kingdom because it is the only hope for our world. I honor King Charles. I honor King Charles. I give him all the respect that he is due. But there is only one king who can save us. There is only one king who can rescue humanity from all that we have brought upon ourselves. And our gospel that we dare not keep quiet about. That we dare not shrink back from. That we dare not just keep as our own kind of, oh, that's nice for them. They've got their Christian culture. But our message, our truth, our narrative, our story, our gospel is that Jesus is the king who can set all of humanity free from the dominion of darkness and bring us safely into the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen.